Good morning, and welcome to Storagetown Presbyterian Church and to this week's video worship. I'm so glad that you are able to be with us today and to worship the Lord. A couple of announcements as we prepare for worship today. Uh, first, uh, financial statements for contributions have been sent out in the mail, so uh, you should get those shortly. If you have any questions about your statement, uh, check in with Iris, and uh, she'll be happy to help you. Also, uh, the uh, Bible study on Wednesday has uh, started back up this week. Uh, we'll be on air Wednesday at 11. Uh, if you uh, didn't get the email with the Zoom link, uh, it is posted in the bulletin. And so uh, you can uh, copy that link or the password and all the details uh, to your uh, Zoom account. We are still in virtual worship, but we uh, look forward to uh, getting back together soon. Uh, prayers uh, for our church family as we uh, continue to uh, stay connected during this unusual season and uh, prayers for a number of our church family who have been uh, struggling with uh, sickness and uh, with uh, uh, problems so uh, please check out the prayer list in the bulletin for details and now let us turn to God in worship through the music of our prayer Jesus Christ, 
and we give thanks to the one who leads us. We are children of the one true God, and we give thanks to the King of Kings. We are the body of Christ, and with one voice we give thanks to the Lord of Lords. We are the handiwork of the Creator, and we give thanks to the Lord. We are the Church of Jesus Christ, His Bride, and we have been called together and empowered by the Spirit. Let us worship and give thanks to our God. Let us turn to God in prayer. Wonderful Lord Jesus, we call upon your name as the Mighty One, the Holy One, the Gracious One. We know that you invite us into your presence. You welcome us at your feet that we might listen and understand, that we might know the path of your kingdom, and that we might gain encouragement to walk in your way. Lord, guide us as your church and bless us as your people. We pray that your spirit would be upon us this day as we worship and adore you, the Messiah, the Savior, the everlasting God, Jesus Christ. Amen. and from the Gospel of Mark. Listen for God's word. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath. The highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in exhortation or put vain hope in stolen goods, though your riches increase. Do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they have done. And reading also from Mark's Gospel, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, the time has come, he said. 
The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked before the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. author Kyle Eidelman tells this story. He sits in a sanctuary, empty. Days before Easter, he is unsure. Unsure what to say, what to do, how he will make Easter. After all, Easter is the most important celebration of the Christian year. He has a large church, hundreds, Thousands of people will come and hear his Easter message, the core of the gospel. And it falls to him to make it special, to make it important, to make it powerful and meaningful in their lives. And so he sits in the sanctuary, alone, 
In an empty space, he contemplates the empty tomb, trying to imagine how in the world he is going to come up with a message that will be powerful enough to change people's hearts or lives, to impact them. Some of those folks have heard the Easter message for dozens, dozens and dozens of times, all of their lives, really. And other folks, this will be their one chance, maybe their only chance to really hear the message. And part of the problem is that last year he preached a great sermon. He hit it out of the park, it was a home run. People were still talking about how powerful his Easter message was last year. How was he going to do that again? It seemed that was the challenge each week, to do something again and again that was going to impress people more or hit them more clearly or powerfully again and again each week, better and more focused than the last. People craved that sort of thing. He walked through his thoughts about what he was going to say and what he was going to do and how in the world he was going to tell people what he needed to tell them, what he was called to tell them, what he was gifted by God and inspired to tell them, what in the world was he going to say to make Easter meaningful. And then it occurred to him that it really wasn't at all about what he had to say that made Easter meaningful. It wasn't at all what he had to say as a person that made any of his messages meaningful. Really, he was just the conduit, just there in front of people. It really was about what God had done, was doing in people's lives. He just needed to try and stay out of the way. He thought about Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are preaching, perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He thought about the Bible. And he realized that Jesus didn't make faith easy. That Jesus wasn't seeking a crowd, wasn't seeking fans. He was laying out a path for followers. I mean, after all, if Jesus wanted to pack the place, he could have done more. He could have done the feeding of the 5,000 every weekend. Could have packed them in. Jesus could have said, hey, now, tomorrow night, the one who brings the most friends, I'll do a personal miracle for you. Or he could have brought the little boy up with his loaves and fishes and said, now, this little guy is willing to do his part. If there's a sponsor out there who's willing to provide food for this whole crowd, well, I'll do a personal dinner at your house for all your friends. Water into wine, the whole shebang. Just put up your hand and let us know you'll sponsor next week feeding of the 5,000. Jesus could have done a lot if he wanted to sell it, if he wanted to make it popular, if he really wanted to hit a home run and get the crowds packed in to be fans. Jesus could have done more. Instead, he said things like, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus did not play games to pack the house. Other people in his day and in our day might say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, let's get them. But Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. People came to Jesus and they offered all sorts of excuses why they couldn't do more, why they didn't have time to follow, and he had no time for any of their excuses. In his book, Pastor Kyle Eidelman lays out this approach and says that people today are fans 
and Jesus seeks followers. His book is entitled, Not a Fan. I remember a few years ago, well, a few more than a few years ago now, I took a group of kids to a youth uh, retreat at the beach. It was a, a great program sponsored every year, and there were just hundreds of high school youth from across the East Coast gathered at the beach. They had a, a great band and great speakers, and while the band played, you know, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, I mean, the kids shouted and were just so excited, full of faith and excitement. And the band leader hollered out, do you love Jesus? And the kids hollered back, woo, woo. They were pumped for Jesus. They were pumped. And it's hard to be critical of that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of energy. And yet I remember wondering how many of those kids would go back to high school that fall and still be so excited for Jesus. How many would go back to their churches and still be so focused and dedicated on following? After all, it's not just those kids. How many of their parents would be that excited for Jesus? How many of those church members would be so excited that they would be standing alongside kids? Woo! Woo! Just like young kids. We all like to be a fan. And some, no doubt, were followers in that youth crowd. And some wanted to be more than followers. Jesus came and he preached the kingdom of God had come near. Repent and believe the good news. And that simple statement that simple statement is the core of Jesus' message. And scholars have little debate about that, and scholars like to debate almost everything. That Jesus preached the kingdom of God, the reign of God is at hand, within our grasp. Repent. Turn around and believe good news. Our familiarity with that passage makes it feel somewhat trivial to us. Our familiarity with that passage makes us feel we can skip over it. After all, we're, we're longtime Christians. We know what this is about. We decided eons ago to follow Jesus. We know all about being church members about being church officers and church leaders, about coming to church and handing out bulletins. I mean, we got this church thing down. And yet the word of the Lord comes to us again and again, and it falls strangely on our ears. Believe good news in a world full of selfish news, in a world of hate filled news, destructive news, overwhelmingly scary news in a world that seeks to shock and shame, believe good news. In a world of self-affirmation, in a world of self-assurance and self-assertiveness, this passage calls us to turn again and again and again to the kingdom of the reign of God, the rule of God in our lives, and to be governed by God. The English word believe can sometimes be uh, interpreted to be a cognitive idea, that we uh, assent with our minds, we accept the idea that God exists, or we accept the idea that Jesus was the Messiah. But the idea in Greek and in the ancient world was that belief was a relational term. Trust. Trust Jesus. Trust the reign of God, the kingdom of God. We have that idea in Psalm 62 this morning. Trust in God. And the Hebrew word for trust implies safety, as in 
trustworthy. God is trustworthy. And the psalmist separates God from all the other things that we tend to count on. The things that those of low estate or those of high estate or all of us in between look to to manage our lives and to count on. Those things are not trustworthy. God is trustworthy. God is our fortress, our salvation, our rock. And the other things that we trust in, people, the economy, the politics, political ideas, even the path that we imagine for our lives, the things that we trust in this world are not completely trustworthy. But trust is a complicated thing. It's not a decision of the will. It is a pattern of the heart. And the Western Enlightenment way of thinking is that trust is like an argument, a, a chain of logical conclusions, and that that trust, that certainty, is only as dependable as the weakest link. But really, certainty, trust, faith, is like a web a web of conclusions and connections, a web of ideas that holds us up. And there are times when pieces of the web fall away and we reconnect in other pieces, but that is the trust we have in God. The late James Fowler, theologian and psychiatrist and educator, wrote about stages of faith, stages of trust. And he, he thought that people have a kind of developmental growth in faith. Uh, like uh, kids changing their pattern of thinking or people growing in their understanding of society or morality. That people grow in their patterns of faith. And that faith was really just something we all have even those who would say they're atheists or agnostic, because faith was just trust, a pattern of trust, a web of trust relationships. And that faith or trust was a communal event. We tended to be around people that we could trust, and that had the same ideas that we had. We tend to be around people that think like us, and that we tend to trust the things that people around us trust. That trust is communal. And that trust is the way that we put the world together. The way that we fit all the pieces of our lives together. Except that as modern people, we very rarely put all the pieces together. Often in our world, we divide life into little segments and we, we have a kind of pattern of trust here and a, a way of doing life this way here and a way of managing relationships over here. And we hardly ever have a kind of universal understanding that holds our entire life and world together. And Jesus calls us to live in the kingdom of God. Turn around from the pieces of life, and behold the good news that's at hand, the reign of God, the kingdom of God. And just like trusting people or ideas, trusting God is complicated. For trusting God is not just about trusting the idea of God. It's about trusting the patterns of our relationship with God about trusting our understanding, our habits of being with God. And those are things that we develop again and again, and we strengthen as we try out our relationship with God. We say, oh, I trust in God, until our bank account falls apart. And then we're not so sure. We say, I, I trust God, except I'm not going to be nice to that person because they're just not nice to me. We say, I, I trust in God, except I need to take charge of my life right now because I'm doing okay, except we're not. Repent. Turn 
and behold the good news in a world full of angry, hate-filled news. Turn and hear good news that the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the power of God is at hand, is within our presence. For God is our rock, our fortress. God is our salvation. And God is trustworthy. The kingdom of God is before us. Believe, live, trust the good news. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today comes from the book of Romans, and I invite you to share in those words as we share in our faith together. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O good and gracious God, we pray for our world, that shakes and quivers with the uncertainties of our modern age. We pray for our world that seeks answers and encouragement, for we know that these things come from you, O oh Lord. And so we open our hearts and our lives to your way, to the power of your kingdom. We open ourselves up, O oh Lord, and we humbly pray that you might reign in our lives, that you might rule in our hearts, that your path, no matter how difficult or uncertain, would be our path. Lord, we walk with you as we know that you walk with us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you might guide us as a people, that together we might bring hope to our world and light to those who sit in darkness. Lord, may we trust in you for you are our salvation, our rock, our fortress. And against you, the powers of this world, and even the wanderings of our heart, have no chance. So, Lord, guide and direct us, encourage and strengthen us, that we might be steadfast in our trust and obedient to you. We offer these words not in our own confidence, but through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we go out into the world, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Be kind and gracious to you. Look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Now and evermore. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you.